Hey guys and welcome to Skilling. Did you know that India is one of the biggest markets in the world for selling cars and yet until recently we didn't have a safety program in place? Fortunately that's changed because now we have what's called as the Bharat New Vehicle Safety Assessment Program which stipulates that every car that hits the door has to be compliant. Since we are seeing a lot of videos on the internet showing these crash tests and since manufacturers are also selling cars based on the safety ratings they get, we felt it'll be a good idea to see how exactly our cars built to be safe and what the science behind it is. Hi Satish, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you tell us a bit more about NCAP in detail please? Great. Uh, so basically NCAP stands for New Car Assessment Program. Uh, global NCAP is something that uh, they'll have certain uh, set of regulations, meaning the testings uh, globally for all the countries. And uh, now based upon these testings, your car will be allowed to, your car will be given a certain rating and then it will be allowed to hit on the roads. So now let's say you are in, we are in India and then we Indians have our own uh, end caps depending upon our road conditions. Similarly, they'll have different end caps for Australia, Japan and Europe and so on. If a car passes a test in India, but it doesn't pass the end cap test in a different country, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Yeah, true. So basically, uh, we let's say you are a manufacturer here in India and then you are trying to launch a car here for the Indian market. Uh, so you have a global end cap and then you have an Indian end cap. So what you primarily focus is the Indian end cap. Let's say you have a car and then you do a frontal press crashing. Uh, so your car may fail in uh, the global end cap, uh, the ratings that they set, and then it might pass the Indian end cap. So the, their ratings might be different, right? So once you clear the Indian uh, end cap, you are allowed to launch a car here in India. So what are the differences between uh, global end cap and what we have in India over here? Yeah, uh, so basically uh, global end cap is, ba uh, is based upon the US roads and it, depending upon the accidents and all the other things, they have set up uh, uh, equal uh, ratings or let's say the equal t crash testing requirements. Uh, whereas in here in India, the road condition might differ, right? So depending upon our road condition, this, these end caps are uh, now being uh, developed. And I'm assuming the major difference is going to be in testing speeds. Indian roads are much slower compared to roads outside. Yeah, absolutely. So say for example, like you are doing a frontal crash. So you do it in a, so in global end cap, we do it like for 64 or 65 kmph. Whereas in India, like we do it for 56 kmph. So just because the roads are like that. So we, the parameter or the criteria for the testing might change. So these are the few changes that you can see when you compare with the global, with the Indian uh, end caps. Can you walk us through the frontal crash once? So frontal crash basically helps us to understand uh, what happens to the occupant when this car is being rammed against a rigid wall. Will they survive or not, right? Uh, so depending upon the various end caps, let's say for Indian and uh, European, Japanese, uh, the front, they have multiple frontal crash tests. So one is like, generally we do a full rigid wall crash, uh, meaning the entire front part of the car is being rammed against rigid wall. Whereas uh, in other end caps, you have like 50% offset, uh, meaning like only front, this portion of the car will be uh, hit against the rigid wall and you have 40, 30 and then you have 10. Why are there such variations? So based on the previous accidental data, they have come up with such uh, offset frontal crash testings uh, just to understand how the frontal portion of the car behaves when only one half of the car is being hit to the rigid wall. So the front part of the car is actually the most crucial component, right? It's, got the, it's probably the most expensive as well. It's got the engine, it's got the axle and so on. So, what are the challenges you face in uh, designing this as such? Uh, so, the, the frontal part of the car uh, is designed such a way it has to crumple and absorb more energy, right? So, when it is very rigid, it doesn't uh, absorb energy, rather it passes the energy through the, uh, to the occupant, right? So, being a design engineer or being a manufacturer, uh, your uh, first idea has to be how do I make this zone, uh, this part of the car little softer so that it absorbs more energy and passes very less energy to the occupant compartment, right? So when the car is being crashed into the rigid wall, there is going to be a, a crash tube in front of this, uh, inside of this ABS plastic bumper, which is going to absorb more force, right? So after that, the force is coming, uh, will be absorbed by the engine components. And then there is going to be a, a, a shotgun kind of structure inside the, uh, the hood, where it, where, it, where it has lot of notches to it. Uh, so th why there are notches because let's say this shotgun is going to hit the rigid wall it has to crumple 
right when it crumples it absorbs it absorbs more energy uh, the remaining energy from the shotgun uh, has to divert right so it has to go to the a pillar and some sort of energy will go to the hinge pillar and then it goes to the sides whereas here it goes to the roof uh, so the diversion takes place uh, in such a way so that the occupant compartment is not disturbed so only less energy is being experienced by the occupant sitting inside okay so it is basically the impact energy from the impact trans travels outside along the body of the yeah. car okay so yeah basically we are making sure that the occupant observe uh, the occupant experiences very less energy we are trying to deviate the energy as much as possible so that was the front of the car how is the side of the car protected from impact yeah so when you take the side of the car so there are the like two major tests one is the vehicle crashing against a rigid pole and another one is some other car coming and hitting your side part of the car so again these are uh, developed using the previous accidental data so different end caps follow different set of uh, testings some might stop only the pole some might even include the uh, another vehicle coming and crashing into your side so what do you get from this right so you try to understand how your side structure of the vehicle behaves so sometimes uh, is it like very uh, soft so that it can penetrate and hit the occupant sitting inside or is it rigid to transfer the forces accordingly so whether it is able to transfer the force from here to the b pillar and then to the roof and similarly we will be able to understand what's happening to the occupant so what about the back of the car are there tests are there any tests done for that uh so it depends it depending upon your end cap so some end caps might have a rear crash as well where another vehicle coming and crashing with your rear part of the vehicle uh but the roof of the car uh, is very crucial uh this helps to understand what happens to the occupant uh, compartment when the car topples do you actually topple the car and test it so they don't actually topple the car at the first so the the roof testing is being done under a certain uh, experimental setup where there is going to be a plate which is going to crush your roof right for certain force and it is going to under uh, and from that we will be able to understand how much weight how much weight we, this roof is going to withstand and usually that is not that should not go uh, beyond four times of your vehicle weight and then uh, you have a certain displacement constraint as well so the roof should not uh, displace into the occupant compartment uh, up to certain level so this is to make sure that it is not hitting the head of the occupant sitting inside so all this while we've been talking about crashing into walls and poles and so on what if i hit a person so now there are a lot of end caps who are concentrating more on the life of the pedestrian who is being hit and uh, so this frontal portion of the car is like very prone to uh, the pedestrian hit uh, let's imagine a cyclist uh, on the way and then somebody is hitting him obviously he'll fall on top of the hood right so uh, the challenge here is to make the hood softer so that he gets out of the impact with less damage but this is metal right how do you make it soft i mean so this is the outer part of the hood and there is something inner part of the hood so th there are two different parts yeah if you look at the interior of the bonnet right uh, or let's say the hood You, you can notice that this is a separate layer and that is a separate layer which has a significant gap in between, in between them right so now when a cyclist falls on top of the hood so the outer hood is where it will take maximum deflection and absorb more energy now uh, the inner so once after observing so the cyclist head will try to hit the inner hood which will prevent uh, prevent the head from hitting the rigid components in the engine bay if you see the inner line here it is mainly for damping the vibrations so when you remove this you can see the entire inner panel and it will have lots of holes to it right so the 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 reason for those holes and cutouts is mainly to reduce the weight of the hood and also the cost reduction so how do they actually test all this i mean to make someone they don't like stand in the way or uh no we have a separate experimental setup uh for the testing so if you can close the hood i can tell you like what's happening on top of the hood in order to test it so they actually have a experimental setup which will throw the dummy head on top of the hood to understand the impact uh, between the hood and the uh, dummy so how do they do it so they'll pick up basically lot of points on top of the hood this is based on the uh, height of the dummy basically so for the adult if they're standing so they'll come and hit somewhere here and they'll pick multiple points here and if there is a cyclist and if he's falling on top of it so they mark the region according to the previous available data 
and also they consider the uh, uh, child occupants when they stand and then when you hit on them so basically these are the region that they will come their head will come and hit so we actually have the head of the dummy and you have a accelerometer inside the head of the dummy right so imagine now the head of the dummy is thrown at the hood with certain velocity right this accelerometer will capture the acceleration and gives you the result from this you calculate the hick now hick yeah so hick is basically a head injury criteria right so that will helps you to understand how much damage the head is taking uh, when it is getting impacted on top of the hood uh, so for say for example when certain end cap says that your hick value should not go beyond 1000 so it's the manufacturer responsibility to keep it as minimum as possible to pass through the test this is absolutely fascinating if there's so much of thought which has gone in just for the exterior of the car i can't imagine what they could have done inside you know to keep the passengers safe Okay, so Satish, walk us through the inter uh, the safety features built inside the car. So let's start with the seat belt. Seat belt has major contribution when it comes to uh, occupant safety. So I'll I'll give you an example. What happens to someone when they don't wear a seat belt and then they crash into the vehicle or a tree? Uh, so you let's say you are traveling like 90 km/h and then you are hitting. Your car stops, but still you will be traveling in the same speed. So that's when you tend to move out of your position and hit on the other rigid uh, components inside the car, and you finally end up and you finally end up with a lot of injuries. So now let's imagine the same case with the seat belt. So when you are wearing a seat belt, seat belt makes sure that you are in the position during the event of crash. So you so you don't tend to move out of your position and hit on other components inside the car. So that's how seat belt helps you. Okay, can you tell us a bit more about airbags? So seat belt basically stops your torso in moving forward, but then your head it is still having the same velocity. So your head tend to hit on the steering wheel. So when the airbag inflates, the airbags make sure the impact between your head and the steering wheel is soft. So you mean to say that the airbag and the seat belt have to work together? Yeah. So seat belt. Has to make sure that you are in position so that only your head travels first, where your airbag can save it. So they have to work. Okay, so you're talking a lot about softening the impact during the crash. Is that the reason why all these components inside are made of plastic? Yeah, it is. So you have all your components made up of plastic here, and your air pillar, uh, sorry, your B pillar and your A pillar. So let's say when you are uh, in the event of crash, you though you have a seat belt, you sl slightly tend to move. To your right or the left, right? So when you are moving here, and then when it is very rigid, you tend to hurt your shoulders. So that's why these components are made up of plastic. Okay, and you also have uh, airbags in the same. Yes. So you have certain top end vehicles will have curtain airbags. So the airbags will inflate from here to here, just covering this entire glass portion, so that when you hit on hit your head, uh, when you come in contact with the glass, so your head is not hurt so much. Same goes with the B pillar. So you have certain airbags inflating from the B pillar to make sure that your head uh, is safe from the damage. So coming back to plastics. Uh, so if you take a look at these components, uh, these are also made up of plastic, just to make sure that your knees are uh, protected in the event of uh, frontal crash or uh, whenever you are getting in touch with the, these components uh, during any sort of crash. So again, coming back to this impact thing, the passenger comes and. Hits the airbag, and the airbag absorbs the impact, and so on. That that is fine. But the airbag is coming out of uh, the steering wheel, which is a rather rigid component, right? I mean, how much impact that? How much impact can the airbag actually withstand? Because it is still fixed on something which is very solid. Correct. Uh, so the steering wheel is one of the rigid components that we have here, and uh, now here comes the challenge for the manufacturer how to uh, make this component softer. Just to make sure that your head is not getting injured much. Uh, so th then, that's how they came up with this collapsible steering column concept, where when you hit the steering column with certain level of force, the steering column automatically moves it, so that you you don't have a rigid component to hit. At least you have some travel distance where you you end up uh, coming out of very less damage. Talking about the rear occupant safety, let's go back to the frontal crash again, uh, where. these at the event of crash the rear occupant will also try to move forward right so that's why we have an airbag from this seat and from this seat which will make sure that the impact between the occupant and the seat is softer 
and provided they will also be wearing seat belt and that will also keep them in, in place. Thank you so much Satish for taking the time off for explaining all this to us. I had no idea there was so much going on inside and outside the car in terms of passenger safety. And the next time you guys go to buy a car, remember everybody is looking for your safety as well. Stay tuned to Skillet.